Walt was too old to fight, but he proudly watched as his brother George in his blue Union jacket marched off to war. Union forces, however, were soundly beaten during the first major conflict, the Battle of Bull Run. Walt felt full of gloom and apprehension. He wrote poems for the newspapers to rally people behind the Union cause to reunite the country. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force. Still, with a growing sense of dread, Walt read the letters George wrote home of bullets flying overhead and comrades shot and killed. When Walt went to the Broadway Hospital in Manhattan to visit an injured stagecoach driver, he saw haunting reminders of the war, soldiers brought up from the battlefront. He wrote in a newspaper article, I have many hours afterwards, in far different scenes, had the pale faces, the look of death, the appealing eyes, come curiously of a sudden, plainly before me. He began spending time with these soldiers, hoping to cheer them, wishing he could do more. Every morning as he drank his coffee, Walt scanned the newspapers, checking the lists of wounded and dead, worrying about George. He poured over hundreds of names. John Clare, 69th, New York, hip. D.C. Grindle, Company K, 16th, Maine, leg. F. Hanscom, Company D, 2nd, Delaware, I. Major Hargan, 88th, New York, killed. On the morning of December 16, 1862, Walt read George's name. There was no information about George's injury. Was he badly hurt? Walt rushed toward Washington and spent the next two days and nights searching the hospitals. He was tired, hungry, and very discouraged. He couldn't find George anywhere. Grimly, Walt caught an army train headed south, reaching the camp hospitals in Falmouth, Virginia, the next day. There, men lay in rough tents pitched on the frozen ground. They slept on layers of twigs covered by blankets. Walt hurried from tent to tent, from man to broken man, feeling huge and helpless. At last, he found his brother. George's cheek had been pierced by an exploding shell. Luckily, the wound wasn't serious. Walt later wrote home to their mother, When I found dear brother George and found that he was alive and well, oh, you may imagine how trifling all my little cares and difficulties seemed. They vanished into nothing. Walt stayed at camp for over a week, visiting the hospitals. He wrote in his notebook, I go around from one case to another. I do not see that I do much good, but I cannot leave them. At night, Walt slept in George's tent. He loved learning the soldiers' lingo, bivouac for camp, army pies and wash for crackers and coffee. Sitting around the campfires, he met men from all over the North and heard their tales of battle. As Walt learned more about their struggles and experienced their hard accommodations for himself, he began to give these soldiers a voice. By the bivouac's fitful flame, a procession winding around me, solemn and sweet and slow. But first I note the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire, the silence, while wind and procession thoughts, O oh, tender and wondrous thoughts, of life and death, of home and the past, and loved, and of those that are far away. By now, George's cheek had healed. It was time for Walt to go. He offered to help transfer the wounded to the hospitals in Washington. Then the two brothers said goodbye. In Washington, Walt was appalled by the suffering the soldiers endured. Gunshot wounds, typhoid fever, amputations. Soon, each face had a name. Walt intended to stay only a few weeks. But when he saw that his good cheer helped some patients even more than medicine, he knew he could not leave, writing home, Many of them have come to depend on seeing me and having me sit by them a few minutes, as if for their lives. Walt picked up a small job, a few hours a day in a government office. The pay wasn't much, but it was enough, with donations from friends, to fill a sack with little gifts. David S. Giles, Company F, 28th, New Jersey Volunteers, once an apple. Janice Mayfield, 7th Virginia Volunteers, two oranges, 
Henry D. Boardman, Company B, 27th Connecticut Volunteers. Once a rice pudding, not very sweet. Walt jotted it all down in his tiny notebooks as he made his hospital rounds. Black, white, Union, Confederate, Walt nursed whomever he saw. He fed men too weak to eat. He bathed fevered foreheads with cool, wet cloths. Sometimes he changed the dressings on a man's wounds. Bearing the bandages, water, and sponge, straight and swift to my wounded I go. To each and all one after another I draw near, not one do I miss. Winter turned to spring, and spring turned to summer. Walt mourned the passing of so many young lives. At times he had to busy himself, bustling around the hospital to avoid crying. To see such things and not be able to help them is awful he wrote home. I feel almost ashamed of being so well and whole. After leaving the hospital, he'd find himself trembling at what he had seen. Then he'd walk for hours through the dark streets under the still, silent moon. In the mornings, as he headed to his job, Walt often saw President Abraham Lincoln ride by. The two bowed to each other, the war weighing on them both. Walt felt Lincoln's determination to heal the country. He began to see Lincoln as a captain, guiding his ship through troubled waters, and wrote in his notebook, His face and manner are inexpressibly sweet. I love the president personally. Walt continued writing his poems and hoped for a swift end to the fighting. But the war dragged on through its third year, and more and more men arrived at the hospitals every day. As Walt spent time with them, he came to understand America more deeply, Despite their suffering and sadness, the soldiers were courageous, dedicated, even hopeful. Walt found in them, he wrote to a friend, the best expression of American character I have ever seen. And he knew that his poem celebrating Americans would not be complete until he honored these soldiers. Walt grew so attached to them that he sometimes stayed at the hospital late into the evening, keeping close but quiet company so that a young soldier would not have to die alone. Washington, August 10, 1863. Mr. and Mrs. Haskell, I thought it would be soothing to you to have a few lines about the last days of your son, Erastus. Many nights I sat in the hospital by his bedside till far in the night. The lights would be put out, yet I would sit there silently, hours, late, perhaps fanning him. He always liked to have me sit there, but never cared to talk. I shall never forget those nights. I write to you this letter because I would do something at least in his memory. He is one of the thousands of our unknown American young men in the ranks about whom there is no record or fame, no fuss made about their dying so unknown. But I find in them the real precious and royal ones of this land. Mr. and Mrs. Haskell, though we are strangers and shall probably never see each other, I send you my love, Walt Whitman. Day after day, Walt returned to the hospitals, trying to stay cheerful, but by the end of June 1864, he was exhausted. When the doctors ordered him to take a break, Walt was too tired to protest. He traveled home to rest at his mother's house and work on his book of Civil War poetry. He called the book Drum Taps, a sound that always stirred him when he heard soldiers marching. Walt wrote to a friend that he would move heaven and earth to publish the book as soon as he was able. By January, Walt felt stronger. He returned to Washington, caring for the soldiers as often as his health allowed. But he was home visiting his family on April 9, 1865, when the South surrendered to the North. After four long years, at last, the Civil War was over. Walt and his family barely had time to rejoice. Five days after the war ended, tragedy stunned the nation. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Walt was too upset to eat or even speak. He read the newspaper's grim accounts. Then he walked the streets of Manhattan, rain dripping from the black banners of mourning. A few days later, Walt boarded a train for Washington. Heartsick, he spent the next several months composing poems that voiced America's grief. Oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. 
the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But, O oh, heart, 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 O oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, falling cold and dead. Walt's words helped him say goodbye to Lincoln as well as to the war. Now Walt, like the rest of the country, turned toward peace. Slowly, America began to heal, led by her new president, Andrew Johnson. As the last wartime soldiers recovered, Walt continued his hospital visits with growing certainty that his small part in helping his country had been the greatest privilege and satisfaction of his life. And soon, he finished his book of Civil War poetry, Drum Taps. News of the poem spread after a friend published a tribute to Walt and wrote letters to newspapers about Walt's years of hospital service. As people learned of the sacrifices made by the good gray poet, they read his poetry. For all my days, not those of peace alone, the days of war the same, for all the brave strong men, devoted, hardy men, who forward sprung in freedom's help, all years, all lands. Thanks, joyful thanks, a soldier's, traveler's thanks. And as they read, they heard in every line the voice of the nation. Whoever you are, now I place my hand upon you, that you be my poem. <laughs>